Hello, my name is Kevin Carman, and today I would like to talk about UINS and RNP and the Smith antigens in autoimmune diagnostics. So briefly, I'll be going over the uh, biological background of Smith antigens, uh, further called SM proteins, or S and SNRNPs. Uh, the significance in autoimmune diseases of these two antigens, commercial sources available for purchase, uh, why we'd want to use protein microarrays for the diagnosis of autoimmune disorders, and some results from an initial study of four antigens here in-house. So after the Human Genome Project was completed, it was found that the human genome contained 20,000 to 25,000 protein-coding genes. Uh, this contradicts the finding that there are at least 100,000 proteins in the human body at high or medium abundance. So if we look at the central dogma of biochemistry, we see that DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated into proteins. So there should be a one-to-one -one relationship uh, with genes and proteins, but it turns out it's not true. There's kind of a step 1.5, if you will. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then spliced into a mature messenger RNA and translated into protein. So in the simplest form, RNA splicing involves two ex exons and an intron. The exons contain the protein coding portion of the gene, and the intron contains non-coding portions of the gene. Um, what happens is the intron is removed through a splicing event, and the two exons are merged to form a coherent uh, protein coding RNA. There are many forms of splicing. Uh, I won't go into them in too many details, but uh, suffice it to say there are lots of methods of alternative splicing for RNAs that can lead to a high diversity of proteins. So the spliceosome. This is by far the coolest enzyme in the human body. Uh, it is rivaled in complexity only by an RNA polymerase or a ribosome. So the spliceosome is a large, multi-subunit enzyme that catalyzes the directed splicing of pre-mRNA into a mature mRNA. It consists of five SNRNPs, henceforth called SNRPs, and each SNRP is a multi-protein complex bound to a small nuclear RNA, or SNRNA. For the SNRPs alone, there are 61 proteins and five SNRNAs. When you add in all the associated factors in uh, RNA splicing, there's hundreds of proteins involved in this process. So it's quite an intricate and complicated process. So the SNRP we're going to be most interested in is the U1 SNRP. It is the most common SNRP involved in autoimmune disease. Uh, what it does is it binds the RNA at the 5' prime side of the intron, thus defining where the intron starts. It consists of a seven-membered ring of SM proteins and also three auxiliary proteins called U1A, U1C, and U170K. And all these proteins are bound to U1SNRNA. Uh, the crystal structure of this complex was solved to 5.5 angstroms by Kiyoshi Nagai in 2011. Shown here are the SM proteins forming a heptameric ring. Uh, what you have is a, is a seven-membered ring with a nice positively charged inner surface where the ring binds the RNA. Shown here is a model of the SM proteins with the RNA bound in the middle. This is the whole U1 SNRNP particle. Uh, what you can see is in teal are the SM proteins uh, they, they kind of form a donut, and the RNA threads right through the middle. And then U1A, U1C, and U170K are pictured around the antigen. All these proteins are involved in autoimmune disease. So now let's look at the Smith antigens and U1 SNRP and autoimmunity, or, or why we really care about these in terms of autoimmune diagnostics. So the Smith antigens are a highly specific marker for SLE. A positive SM is highly specific for SLE, as in 99% uh, specific. 
It only occurs in 15% of Caucasian patients or 35% are Asian or African American patients. Uh, the sensitivity can be improved to 70% or more using peptides derived from SMD1 and SMD3. So U1 SNRP is a highly specific and highly sensitive marker for mixed connective tissue disorder, otherwise called uh, general rheumatism. Negative SM and positive U1 SNRP autoantibodies are essentially 99% specific and sensitive for MCTD. Uh, negative U1 SNRP uh, autoimmune reactivity essentially rules out MCTD. Positive U1 SNRP autoantibodies are also found in 13 to 35 percent of SLE patients. So bacterial recombinant proteins are inexpensive to produce, can be rapidly produced, and they get a high, high level of expression. Uh, some of the disadvantages are you have no post-translational modifications. Uh, solubility is sometimes an issue with mammalian proteins, and there are very few folding chaperones involved. Uh, those are some of the disadvantages there. Insect cell recombinant, uh, you have a lot of the advantages that E. coli have. Uh, the only disadvantages are, again, some of the post-translational modifications you'd find in mammals are not present. Human recombinant proteins, uh, the main advantage is you get a native protein, which is always great for assays such as these. Uh, the disadvantages are the, the cost and a lower level of expression compared to uh, baclovirus or E. coli. Uh, human native proteins, uh, same thing. You can purify entire ribonucleic protein particles or SNRPs from human native sources. It's extremely expensive and expression level is very low. Or, and then bovine or animal sources, you can get a native protein, uh, and it is very inexpensive. The only problem with that would be the heterogeneity uh, to human proteins. So I'd like to take a little time and talk about some of these sources in more detail now. So the first choice would obviously be uh, bacterial recombinant proteins. You get a low-cost, high-yield protein. Uh, shown here is a figure of silver-stained SDS page showing native U1 SNRP on the left and individually purified U1 SNRP components from E. coli on the right. As you can see, the expression level from E. coli is huge. Some of the, the main disadvantage of E. coli being you don't have post-translational modification. Uh, post-translational modification is extremely important for diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis. Also in E. coli, many eukaryotic proteins are insoluble or not expressed. Um, this forces you to either purify the protein denatured as a fusion protein or removing domains or fragments from the target protein. So F SF9 baclovirus provides an excellent platform for expressing eukaryotic proteins, uh, maybe ones that aren't able to express in E. coli. It can mediate di disulfide bonds and has eukaryotic tRNAs. There is still a very high level of expression. Uh, some of the disadvantages are it lacks mammalian post-translational modifications. Its uh, expense is on par with mammalian cell culture. And it takes a little bit of time to optimize your baclovirus titer. So recombinant human expression by, say, an overexpression vector is unable to express uh, or overexpress U1 SNRP. Uh, expression levels of U1 SNRP are very low in human cells, and all the human cell culture is pretty expensive. Uh, in this case, bovine U1 SNRP and HeLa U1 SNRP have a peptide sequence homology of over 98%. So these would be a good target protein to purify from animal sources. And also, cows and humans have a very similar post-translational modification system. Uh, just as an example, native human purification of UN SNRP is very expensive and difficult. So this shows a figure from 50 confluent 10 centimeter plates of HeLa cells. This was purified by antisense chromatography. Uh, you got 200 micrograms of active UN SNRP, and one microgram is shown on here. 
So this is an extremely high cost purification for not a lot of UN center particle. So in summary, the best choice for antigen depends on the downstream application. Uh, is it necessary for it to have post-translational modifications to get your results? You know, do, you, do you need to have an intact native particle or can you look at components or peptides? Say, do we need to look at the entire U1 SNRP or is U1C or U170K going to be just fine? Uh, does the antigen have to be denatured in, or in its native form? You know, can we purify it from an insoluble fraction in E. coli? And then is heterogeneity going to be a problem between species? In this case, we had a 2% uh, divergence, so probably wouldn't be a big problem. But say if it was 90% or 80% similar. So now I'd like to talk about why we'd want to use protein microarrays as a diagnostic tool for autoimmune disorders. This shows a typical schematic of a clinical diagnosis of autoimmune disorders. So these eight tests could easily be placed into one microarray that's less than six by six millimeters. So this is a protein microarray developed by a group out of the Stanford Medical School. This is a 13 antigen autoimmune panel that diagnoses eight different autoimmune diseases. So if you're using a protein microarray to diagnose autoimmune diseases, you could use many fragments of the same protein and thus monitor epitope spreading. Epitope spreading is a hallmark of disease uh, progression and flare-ups. You can also monitor the effectiveness of treatment. Uh, you can check the effectiveness of anti-malarial drugs for knocking down autoantibodies, for instance. And if that's effective, you don't have to move on to more harsh treatments such as immune system suppressants or interferon and tum tumor necrosis factor blocking drugs. protein microarray could easily uh, identify either IgG or IgA autoantibodies showing an, a Th1 or Th2 immune response. This could be done multiplexed in the same well on the same spot. This would aid in making a decision about treatment with monoclonal antibody cytokine inhibitors. And then there's the economy. You could print a 90 antigen array with 10 replicates per antigen for less than $3 after assaying. 